Hello everyone, good afternoon to everyone. Welcome once again to today's episode of the SFF or the Singapore Fintech Festival Green Shoot series on digital currencies. My name is Gabriel, your host of today's session and we're coming to you live from Bridge Plus. We are currently into part three of the digital currency series co-organized with BIS and supported by Tomasic. We're also roughly about nine weeks away from the annual Singapore FinTech Festival. Just to let you know, we'll be rolling some updates to you in the next couple of weeks, so please keep your eyes out for them. While at the same time, if you look at the chat box right at the side, if you're watching with us on Zoom right now, you'll see some of my colleagues posting some of the social media channels you can follow us on. This year's theme touches heavily on Web 3.0 and its impact on financial services, not just today, but we're also looking at it tomorrow. This, in fact, is very much in line with the theme for today, where we work together with the BIS Innovation Hub here in Singapore, and the four central bankers are all coming together to discuss the multi-CBDCs for international settlements and how it could change the future of payments. International settlement on a common platform could make cross-border payments as cheap and efficient as domestic payments today. Case in point, pay now. This vision of a common settlement platform has been discussed for quite a long time, decades, some might even say. But governance on a shared platform has always been kind of a bit of a stumbling block. Now, could decentralized technologies and CBDCs then create a path forward for a group of central banks to operate on a shared platform for transactions in multiple currencies? Is the vision for such platform even valid? If so, what are the pragmatic next steps that central bank, the central banking community essentially must take to make this a reality? And how will this then transform or change the future of banking of payments as we know it? And to share more, I'm going to hand it over to the experts, right? We've got Mr. Chris Thompson, who's the Deputy Head of Payments Policy, Reserve Bank of Australia. We've got Farzali Ismail, who's the Assistant Governor of the Bank Nagara, Malaysia. Her Christine, Acting Divisional Head of the FinTech Unit all the way from South Africa Reserve Bank. Last but not least, we have our very own Mr. Somnendu Mohanty, Chief FinTech Officer of MAS. And to lead this discussion, we then also have Andrew McCormick, who is the center head uh, for the BIS Innovation Hub here in Singapore. Right, this session will also be open for an online Q&A. If you look at the bottom of the screen, ladies and gentlemen who's watching on Zoom, we've got a Q&A function. Please go ahead, ask all your questions. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand the time over to Andrew. Andrew, please. Thanks, Gabriel. All right, well, um, so I'm Andrew McCormick. I'm the center head of the BIS Innovation Hub here in Singapore. Absolutely honored to be sharing this virtual stage with my esteemed colleagues. Um, you know, we, uh, we've assembled this all-star cast uh, uh, for this third panel of the BIS SFF Green, Suits, Green Shoot session on digital currencies uh, to discuss if and how central bank digital currencies or CDBCs uh, might be used for international settlements to potentially change the future of cross-border payments. Uh, and it just so happens, uh, and this is a total coincidence of course, that we've, uh, these fine folks represent the central bank uh, stakeholders and partners in the recently announced uh, Project Dunbar, the BIS Innovation Hub project from here in Singapore. Um, so the BIS Innovation Hub is extremely proud to be working with um, Bank Nagara Malaysia, with the Reserve Bank of Australia, with the South African Reserve Bank, and of course the Monetary Authority of Singapore um, on Project Dunbar. And as you may have guessed, the, uh, um, we are exploring the concept of an always-on tokenized CDBC network to improve cross-border settlements uh, and global payments connectivity. So with that, I'll kick off into the first uh, round of questions. Um, Based on a recent survey from the BIS, 86% of central banks are indeed researching the potential for CDBCs. 60% are actively experimenting with the technology, and 14% have been said to be deploying projects or pilots actively. Uh, many of the organizations here that you guys represent um, have gone way beyond research towards building and testing central bank digital currency platforms. So I'll give you each a few minutes to talk about you know, what you've done to date and why your central bank is interested in the concept of central bank digital currencies. I'll start with you, uh, Herco. 
Uh, perfect. Thanks so much, Andrew. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to our audience, wherever they may find themselves. So from a retail or CBDC perspective, uh, we as the SOG are continuing our research into the feasibility, desirability and appropriateness of CBDC as electronic legal tender for general purpose retail use, um, very complementary to cash. So the objective of this feasibility study is to consider how the issuance of general purpose CBDC will feed into the SOG's policy position and mandate. And then on the wholesale side, we are currently finalizing the second phase of our project Corka, with Corka being the Zulu word for to pay. Um, and this explores the policy and regulatory implications of DLT-driven innovation in financial markets. So more specifically, the scope of Project Corka 1 was to trial interbank wholesale settlement using DLT, while Project Corka 2 will issue clear and settled debentures on DLT using tokenized money. One of the key technical objectives of Project Walker 2 is exploring interoperability in a financial market with multiple tokenized assets. So from um, our perspective as the SOB, we play to learn to stay close to international developments and the emerging and ever-evolving international dialogue around digital money more broadly and CBDC in particular. Uh, then from a regional payments perspective, the SOB currently operates the real-time growth settlement system for the Southern African Development Community, or the SADC RTGS in short, which was originally established in part to support and facilitate trade in the region among member countries. So in line with this objective of promoting regional trade, cross-border CBDC interoperability and usage from a regional perspective um, may therefore have the potential to increase the pace at which money changes hands or increase the velocity of money by speeding up cross-border payment versus payment and therefore uh, stimulate trade and economic activity more broadly in the Southern African region. Um, and then lastly, and I quote from the first project Corka report, um, an important outcome from this project is the realization that there is more with which to deepen and expand our knowledge. It is evident that significant benefits will be realized by leveraging collaboration across an industry and even more so when global communities work to get a close quote. So what I think is really interesting given the participants in Project Dunbar is that there is some form of emerging convergence towards, uh, or towards a common appreciation that exploring uh, the potential benefits of a shared multilateral and multi-currency CBDC uh, possibly a natural next step um, on the broader CBDC journey. And from that perspective, we are absolutely thrilled to be involved in Project Dunbar. Thanks, Sandy. Great, thanks, Sarko. Uh, next, I'll go to uh, Fra for a, a perspective from Malaysia. Uh, I think we've got audio issues there, so. No, we're good, we're, we're good. good. Okay. All right, thank you, Andrew. Um, let me begin by thanking MAS and BIS Innovation Hub for bringing us together today. I mean, when we look at CBDC, it should not be an end in itself. It should be a means to foster good public policies. So here at Benigara, we are interested in CBDC in three important respects. First, we see it as a potential for the potential for CBDC to address the current frictions in the cross-border payment arrangements. I mean, you might know that Malaysia is one of the most open economies in the world. Our trade to GDP is about 130%. So anything that will give substantive cost savings and productivity gains would clearly enhance our trade competitiveness. So by enabling uh, instant settlement, for example, CBDC has the potential to shorten the transaction chain and uh, mitigate the cost trapped in, uh, for example, in Nostro accounts, thus resulting in faster, cheaper uh, cross-border payments. Uh, secondly, we see CBDC as an enabler that would afford us with an opportunity to reimagine and future-proof our own domestic wholesale payment systems, the Rentas. Now, although Rentas has been operating at very high levels of availability, efficiency, and resilience, the application of uh, CBDC and DLT has the potential to bring it to the, to, to the next level. For example, uh, we could reduce the single point of failure risk. We could uh, enhance the efficiency of liquidity management. We could simplify compliance processes. Uh, and, you know, we could, we could enable new use cases such as settlement of tokenized assets. And thirdly, of course, we see CBDC as a catalyst that will spur greater innovation in the financial sector. So we like it. So what do we do? We do three things. Um, first, we, uh, we did an analytical framework to assess the necessity and identify the preconditions for us to start issuing CBDC. Now, it's still preliminary, but at this point, we don't see a need for us to immediately issue CBDC for a couple of reasons. Number one, 
uh, our domestic payment systems, including uh, the retail payments, retail uh, 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 real payment systems, continue to support the needs of the economy and facilitate efficient digital payments. Uh, our RPP, for example, has been enormously successful, uh, so we don't see the need for it. So secondly, our financial system continues to support the functioning of the economy. Uh, while meeting the needs of uh, individuals and businesses. So in other words, you know, uh, what we have is, is, is good enough to safeguard our monetary and financial stability. Uh, nevertheless, I mean, we are keen to build our internal capacity and understand the area of CBDC, including uh, conducting proof of concepts, TOCs. So we want to make sure that we are in a state of readiness to issue CBDC should the need arises. Now, what we have done also is we have identified a list of indicators to which we can monitor closely that would give us uh, data points for us to evaluate the merits and timing uh, when uh, to issue CBDC. Uh, this includes, for example, the level of physical cash usage in Malaysia, the extent to which uh, privately, privately issued uh, digital assets are used for payments in Malaysia, and the extent to which a CBDC is being used to facilitate cross-border trade uh, internationally. Um, uh, secondly, we also undertook uh, work to deepen our technical understanding on CBDC and DLT, including developing our own internal prototype for a blockchain-based digital wallet. Uh, such work now will now progress into POC stage. So besides Project Dunbar, which focuses on cross-border payments, we also have developed a roadmap for a multi-year exploration of CBDC, including testing both wholesale and retail CBDC for domestic use cases. So in short, although we are convinced uh, we won't pull the trigger yet, uh, we, are, we want to be ready when the time comes. So we are in love, but we ain't ready for marriage yet. Sounds, sounds familiar. Um, maybe, maybe stop, we'll go to you next. Well, um, uh, the best way to say what we have done is best explain what happened yesterday. Yesterday, DBS called for a special debate on what to, how to think about DeFi. I would not expect, I would never expect a, a mainstream bank to, to start thinking about how to make money on things which is yet to, develop, to be developed. I think that's the impact we had in this market when, the, when we started Project Ubin. So Project Ubin was our first uh, initiative to build this, uh, 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 this understand, expand our understanding, the technical understanding of digital currencies, where it is applied, and MAS took that step to create a use case to bring tech players, um, crypto, uh, sorry, digital currency infrastructure players to come together. We took a journey over three, four years. We worked on domestic settlement use cases, interoperability. We worked with different central bank on uh, on different use cases for settlement, domestic. Uh, with with Bank of France, we looked at automated uh, market maker install central book, central uh, order book to settle uh, transactions. So we went through this whole journey of use case, uh, understanding how it is applied to existing rails and what is the future rail construct should look like. And what we got out of it is a couple of things. We got a huge community of uh, motivated player who are willing to now start looking at different way to design the future of financial services. And which we all collectively now believe, including our banks here, that uh, the future of financial services is going to ride on digital currencies. And one of the things which we can just ignore is better for collectively as an ecosystem to start uh, thinking about not only central bank use cases like payment infrastructure, but also use cases which is close to their uh, businesses. And just to wrap up, I think uh, I would say, while Project Rubin, we have concluded the whole program and that also had, a, uh, had an outcome called a company called Patio, which was again uh, jointly established by the DBS, uh, JP, JP Morgan, and uh, Tamasek, and they're building the market infrastructure. I think Dunbar gives us that, uh, that optimism that while we can do our little cookie cutter experiments, but so what? Unless different central banks come together and agree on on able to interoperate each other on, on, on cross-border settlement. I think Dunbar is, to me, the last mile of this large experiment, which we have all collectively undertook for many years now. So I hopefully, Andrew, you are going to close the curtain for us. 
I, I helped open it about six years ago, and now I'll try <laughs> and close it. But um, over to you, Chris, uh, from Australia, please. Yeah, th th thanks, Andrew. And I mean, uh, can I just start off by saying that, you know, that, that we at the Reserve Bank are very uh, pleased to be collaborating in this project with, with the BIS Innovation Hub and also with the um, Bank Nagara, MAS and, and South African Reserve Bank. Um, I think it's a really exciting project to be involved in. I mean, we've, we've been involved in CBDC research and on this sort of, I guess, the CBDC research journey for about four years now. And, you know, I guess so, sort, of, sort of to summarise kind of what we've been doing, I mean, we, we, we think about CBDC in this kind of the usual this, you know, split between kind of retail use cases and wholesale. And on retail, I mean, you know, we've done a fair bit of thinking about, um, you know, possible design aspects of what a retail CBDC would look like, potential use cases and rationales for issuance. And we've also looked at kind of what the issue, what potential implications of issuance would be. And we've published a, a few pieces over recent years that have outlined our thinking there. And I guess sort of in, in summary, the point that the position that we're at at the moment is that we, we, don't, we don't really think there's a strong public policy case at present in Australia for us to be issuing a retail CBDC. But, uh, and, and that takes into consideration, I guess, the likely benefits and risks. But, 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 but we very much have an open mind to the possibility that at some point in the future there will be a, a strong case for a retail CBDC in Australia. And so we're continuing to sort of think very carefully about um, those issues and also to sort of observe what's happening in other jurisdictions that are, that are doing work in this space. I mean, it's in relation to kind of a wholesale form of CBDC, I guess, where we've done most of our sort of practical kind of technical research and experimentation to date. Um, and we've done sort of two kind of fairly significant projects, I guess, over the past few years. First one was a sort of a sort of an in-house project we did a few years ago. We, you know, we developed a sort of a sort of fairly limited scope proof of concept of an Ethereum-based wholesale CBDC uh, that could be used for interbank payments. And more recently, over the last year or so, we've been uh, collaborating with a, a number of banks in Australia and some other participants on a, a, a further sort of proof of concept where we've sort of extended on, the, on, on that first project that we've done in a number of different dimensions. Um, so so we've, got, we've had some active sort of research underway on, on wholesale CBDC. And I guess sort of to, sort of to, to pick up, you know, I think you know, maybe one of the things you wanted to talk about here, Andrew, was you know, what, what are some of the be potential benefits of CBDC, particularly wholesale CBDC, which we're actively researching, that we're looking to explore? And I guess I'd sort of um, talk about them in sort of maybe four categories. I mean, one is, one is an issue around access. I mean, access to central bank money as a settlement asset. Um, you know, we know that central banks already issue a form of digital money in the form of accounts that they provide to... Uh, financial institutions and select other financial institutions, uh, uh, sorts of banks and select other financial institutions, and then they can use those accounts to settle obligations. So we're interested in exploring, you know, whether the availability of a sort of a wholesale CBDC provides an opportunity to give um, and, and potentially provides benefits uh, for a wider range of wholesale market participants to be able to be uh, settle in central bank money. So that there's an issue around access. I think there's, a, there's also an issue around risk. You know, to what extent is um, the availability of CBDC does it create does it create risk benefits for the economy, and, and particularly around wholesale settlement processes? Um, and you know, we, we've been exploring that. You know, particularly in our latest project, where we've been looking at a model of issuing CBDC onto a DLT platform, but also having tokenized assets on the same platform and looking at the you know the interaction of those two and and the implications of, you know, a sort of so-called atomic DVP, for example, and whether that reduces risk in settlement processes. So I think there's a kind of a whole issue around risk and does wholesale CBDC uh, give you benefits there. The other one that we're really interested in is around um, sort of programmability and automation um, benefits potentially. And this relates to the risk point of, in, in some ways, but I mean, as we all know, DLT is, you know, they have, and the smart contract functionality offers up a lot of benefits and potentially um, in, in terms of sort of programmability. Um, and using that functionality, you know, your payments with CBDC could be, you know, conditional on various kinds of um, events or characteristics taking place. You know, you can allow for sort of complex, multi-stage, multi-party transactions to be uh, executed sort of automatically, you know, in a, in, a, in a fairly minimal risk kind of way. So, you know, that, then that has a whole bunch of benefits, I guess, potentially for, um, for businesses around efficiency and risk, et cetera. So, so we're definitely very interested in exploring that aspect as part of our, our, part of our work. And the final point I'll pick up on is just, just this to the point that I think Fra mentioned earlier on as well, which is, you know, to what extent can a wholesale CBDC be a catalyst for innovation 
in the way that payments are made and the way that uh, transactions are settled. Um, and, and, you know, so, so we're interested in exploring that aspect. So I think some of those aspects that I've talked about, I think will be relevant to how we think about Project Dunbar and the sorts of um, benefits we might be looking to explore. Um, but I'll, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Andrew. Great, thanks, Chris. <clears throat> Um, and I really like the way that you kind of invoked, you know, the benefits of, of CDBC or potential benefits. And, and maybe that's something we could expand on a little bit. I mean, one of the things that strikes me is, you know, in the wholesale uh, financial markets, there's very little that's sort of always on, right? And, and, and so is, is a CDBC, for example, we talked about atomic settlement, we talked about access, but is, is there, a, is there a, a benefit that's, you know, to do with the fact that this, such a network, either domestically or, or, or cross-border, could be essentially more of an always-on type of service or network? Um, Herco, I'm not sure if you have anything you want to add uh, on that on that kind of uh, line of discussion around the benefits and why a CDBC might specifically uh, uh, be able to enable. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks very much, Andrew. So, um, and, and I think in preparing for the session, I, I reread some of the BIS documents on CBDC, et cetera. And, and I think um, from, from our perspective and referencing the, the 2018 BIS paper on CBDC, one of the key benefits, especially around retail CBDC perhaps, is, is around reducing informal economic activity um, and therefore increasing the number of uh, participants in the formal economy, uh, possibly with the extended and implied benefit of, of increasing the monetary base. Um, I think the numerous potential benefits of CBDC have been well covered by the, the other panelists, but I think CBDC's inherent trait of being both natively and exclusively digital, um, in particular kind of positions it uh, very well in, in the digital age and noting and, and supporting the comments around it being a potential catalyst for innovation. So along this line of thinking um, and, and referencing the, the BIS paper on MCBDC that was uh, published a few months ago, um, I, I think a, a, a really interesting point from our perspective is that uh, is, is almost CBDC's potential to strengthen monetary sovereignty in the digital age. And from both a domestic and a regional perspective, uh, this narrative is something that we as the SOB are keen to explore. Um, but maybe with a strong caveat um, and appreciation for the fact that CBDC is obviously not a silver bullet. Um, and, and I think this, uh, the, the BIS 2018 paper on CBDC makes this point very well that from a financial inclusion and access perspective, CBDC um, does not necessarily alleviate or address all the constraints to access. Um, and I think to Chris's point also just now, um, so uh, especially in the domestic South African context, uh, for certain segments of the population, the barriers to using digital currency may indeed be large um, and, and meaning or kind of with the consequence that the preference for, for trusted alternatives uh, such as cash could remain strong even in the face of CBDC availability. So I think the, the question around um, whether the currently digitally excluded can or will be uh, more included <coughs> to a digital currency um, re remains a pertinent one. Um, and, and I think uh, Chris also mentioned uh, an absolutely fascinating aspect of CBDC in the form that it allows um, kind of the programmability of money. Um, and, and I think that's really interesting in, if you kind of think around it or in, in the sense of it allows um, certain requirements or characteristics to be essentially baked into the CBDC, so to speak. Um, so in our observations of other jurisdictions' exploration of CBDC, I think a common fundamental principle we've seen um, emerging quite strongly is that countries have to solve for the unique domestic policy challenges and contexts. So in the case of South Africa, we have a relatively large informal economy um, that is largely reliant on physical cash, um, which contributes um, to, to pockets of financial uh, exclusion. Um, so I think any innovation that can assist us as a country in reaching the so-called last mile is uh, very well worth exploring. Um, so I think as a result, um, it, it's become evident that the one-size-fits-all solution is not appropriate in, in the CBDC context. Um, and I think this challenge is amplified in the cross-border context when thinking about harmonizing CBDCs from a multilateral perspective. Um, so I think with the programmable money narrative, uh, jurisdictions are able to design CBDC to best cater for the unique needs and, and the requirements of the domestic context. Um, and, and I think from our side, uh, we, we've got a relatively large uh, social grants program, uh, programmable money in the form of CBDC, um, coupled with the associated potential opportunities and implications, um, I think is really a, a highly interesting uh, topic meriting uh, consideration and further exploration. Um, I think let me stop there in the interest of time. Thanks very much, Andrew. Great, thanks, Herco. Um, so, I mean, you guys have been working on, from the MS perspective, you mentioned Banque de France. There's also the global CDBC challenge that you've yes. recently launched. Yes, so, yes. I mean, you know, 
as the chief fintech officer, and you, you, you kind of spend a lot of time thinking about you know, truly innovative things that are harder to see. Um, can you think about, is there anything you want to add to this conversation no, on uh, benefits from, from that kind of truly transformational I, lens? But that's a very good question, I'll say, because, and I'll go back to the traditional rail example. When we connected, as I, I've told many a times, that when we connected Singapore to Thailand using traditional payment rails, we brought down the cost of transfer from $15 to $3. And I always say that there is still $2 to take away from these transactions. That's where the CBDC will play a big role. Uh, or, or a commercial bank issue digital currency. It doesn't have to be a CBDC always. Uh, and uh, yesterday, again, in the DBS event, uh, Kui Juan, who is the chief strategy officer, was presenting uh, 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 their idea that today, if we think about cross-border payment, there, is a, there are multiple players. There are correspondent banks and all these things. If we reduce the number of players there from a buyer's bank to a uh, sender's bank to a receiver bank, and there's a settled bank in between, I think you can write a smart contract now, feasible to write a smart contract, which will take all the process we have today from KYC checks, uh, AML uh, sanction checks, all the regulations, uh, obligations the transaction has to go through, right into the smart contracts, use the, whether it's a commercial bank issue digital currencies or, uh, and then try to automatically settle the transactions. That's not even a theory now. This is, a, this is a work in progress to make it into a production grade infrastructure, which may go along with the traditional rail connectivity we had with Thailand and reduce the cost further to less than a dollar for every hundred dollar we send. To me, that's, a, that's not only a, a remarkable impact, but it's coming at a speed way faster than we, we would have imagined. Right. And I think we should not, uh, I, I mean, I'll not be ashamed to say that this whole, uh, banks, commercial bank putting themselves behind this definitely came from the anxiety the central banks created by experimenting on wholesale CBDC because they didn't want to lose out in this space. That, so they went and put their ideas, their effort to start seeing their role in this whole uh, shift in the payment space. So that's one part. A more controversial part would be that if you go back, go to the future of the de uh, decentralized finance. Now, we all are going to operate on a blockchain network. There are these digital assets, stable coins, CBDCs, maybe, maybe wholesale CBDCs, other cryptos. Then you have these unhosted wallets, and there you have applications. And those applications are running the smart contracts. I think there'll be a competition between wholesale CBDC and stable coins, because who, who can best uh, get into the smart contract to be part of the future payment instruments? So, that's another interesting way to think about as we, uh, as futures, uh, as we're uh, thinking about future design of financial services. Right. Oh, thanks. And I think there. And, and sorry, sorry. Quickly on that, I, I think the with, I, the, uh, my colleagues in central bank spoke about programmability of the money. Yeah. I think one thing we should not uh, forget that in the retail CBDC space today, as we speak, there's an urgent use case which needs to be answered. I think retail CBDC with the programmable take capability can solve it, especially uh, refugee payments, uh, especially uh, during a, a large crisis. You need to get money to people's hand faster. I think, and with a particular purpose when the money could be spent, I think there are the huge existing current crisis which can be addressed using programmable money. I think that's something uh, will be something interesting for many central banks and the banks to look at. Right, from an, from an unhosted or an unbanked perspective. Yes, indeed. Right, right. Um, so we spent a lot of time kind of talking through motivating factors and benefits. I think we've uh, also shed some light on the fact that many countries, including Malaysia and Singapore, have invested heavily in retail uh, payments infrastructure. Yes. And, uh, and certainly that's something that I'm very interested in as well. But, you know, when we launched Project Dunbar today publicly, um, uh, bringing together this group around wholesale multi-CDBC, um, we really do think that this is an opportunity to kind of work together uh, in, in a way that, you know, we've all been working individually or bilaterally. Uh, and this project is something that really brings together now, I think, a wide variety of players with different 
uh, motivating factors who see different benefits, but we can all certainly agree on uh, opportunities to you know, improve the wholesale cross-border settlement function, whether it's remittances and inclusion or generally yes. uh, around, around visions like interconnecting fast payment systems like yes. what you've done with Prompt Pay Pay now or what we've done with uh, Project Nexus. So I almost build non-negotiable. I mean, almost like this is a must-have complementary design Right. If you want to get to that end state, thus Dunbar's design is almost going to be mainstream design if you truly want to build that end-to-end -end future payment rails. And I think the key challenge is, you know, how do we bring central banks together, which we're trying to do in an experimental capacity uh, around a common platform vision yes. for, for wholesale settlement. Um, so maybe, Chris, if you could maybe elaborate a little bit specifically on why the RBA is now kind of interested and keen on, on Project Dunbar, and then more importantly, this vision of a, of a common settlement platform for wholesale multi-CDBCs. Yeah, th thanks, Andrew. I mean, I mean, I as I sort of was saying earlier, I mean, the research that we've done to date in, in at the RBA in Australia has, has been focused on kind of domestic use cases for, for particularly for wholesale CBDC. And so, you know, I think we're we're keen, obviously, to to, to explore the cross-border use cases. I think there's a lot of potential for CBDCs there, and. I mean, as, as, as I'm sure the people in the audience will know, that, that enhancing cross-border payments has become a really a sort of a major priority for, for, for the G20 and the international regulatory community more generally and um, uh, in, in wanting to sort of address some of the frictions that exist in cross-border payments today. So, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of those sort of associated with the sort of correspondent banking model. So, you know, so, so uh, you know, we're really keen to sort of explore how CBDC can, can, can help address some of those challenges. And, I, you know, I, the issue around addressing uh, cross-border payments is, is, is going to be a multifaceted issue, as, as, as the sort of the G20 roadmap is. But, um, but, but I think CBDC is, is, shows some real promise. And so, I guess when I sort of think about uh, Project Dunbar and you know what we're trying to explore here is the potential for different jurisdictions to issue CBDC onto a you know a shared or a sort of common platform that financial institutions could use to. Could, could access directly and then and then use to sell transactions between themselves or on behalf of their customers. So that's sort of, you know, sort of the sort of the model I, I think we're sort of trying to explore there. And um, you know, and so what are, what are some of the benefits I guess that you know that might come from that arrangement that, that I'd like to sort of see see us explore as part of this project. I mean, I think there, um, something to mention many of these points. I mean, you know, is there the potential to reduce the number of intermediaries involved in in payments? Uh, in that sort of model, and, and therefore to take take out costs to increase speed to to reduce even risks around uh, sort of complexity and trend, the, the possibility of transaction failures because you've got so many parties involved otherwise. So that, that that's a really big key thing for us to explore. I, I think the, the issue around um, dealing with some of the challenges of uh, different time zones is also something that you know I'm keen to explore there. Um, you know we have the potential here for a you know, as, as Andrew, you said, a sort of an always on system, you know, something 24 um, seven. And, and, you know, there's gonna be, there's, got, there's gonna be liquidity issues, of course, to be managed around that in a system like this. Um, but I think that's, uh, that, that, that shows a lot of promise as well to be explored. And, and uh, the other, the other, a couple of other issues that I'm sort of interested in exploring as well in this project, I mean, you know, the, the using this technology, um, you know, if we're, if, we're, if we're sort of, for example, exploring you know, DLT or some form of DLT, you know, does that allow us to to improve the effectiveness and sort of reduce the sort of the cost of financial crime monitoring and compliance activities without necessarily sort of changing um, you know the risk the, the, the risk envelope here? So 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 I think um, you know we know today, for example, that you know AML CGF risks are a major concern in cross border payments and compliance activities likely contribute a significant part to you know the cost of those payments. Um, and there's a lot of duplicated activity that occurs in those payments, as, in those payment streams as well. So, you know, I, I'm really keen to explore whether or not, you know, these sort of technology and the use of CBDCs allows us to sort of essentially streamline those activities uh, without under, undermining um, our risk controls. Um, and then the other point I wanted to come back to as well, which I think is really important and, you know, we've said it a lot, but I mean, your know, programmability to me is a really an interesting concept, um, you know, and it offers a lot of opportunity around efficiency, Risk reduction, automation, etc., and so I think that also has a has an interesting role to play in cross-border payments and through the use of CBDC and DLT as well. So, so I'm, I'm keen to explore that in this project. Um, and the final point I wanted to kind of just make here, and it's an obvious point, but um, you know, 
yeah, we, the, the research that we've done to date has, has largely been domestically focused. So, you know, most central banks, I guess, have sort of started off sort of thinking about their domestic situation in, the, in these projects. You know, I think, you know, th this sort of project, you know, hosted and, and facilitated by the, the, BIS, the BIS Innovation Hub is, you know, a really sort of a valuable opportunity for central banks to collaborate um, now and for us to sort of share the information that we've gathered through our domestic research and then bring it to a into a cross-border context. So, that, so that's a, a real valuable part of these sort of projects that the, the BIS Innovation Hub is um, standing up. Thanks. Uh, great, Chris. I, re I really like the, the um, discussion there around kind of the monitoring and kind of compliance-related improvements that could come from something like this. And, and perhaps that relates to even this programmability notion or helping standardize those APIs that would allow, allow that kind of activity to happen in a more automated, um, automated fashion. Um, for, you know, we, we've talked about the notion of a regional settlement platform here in the ASEAN region for many years, and it's had a few you know, fits and starts, I guess you could say. Um, so do you think that something like what we're talking about here on Project Dunbar would be uh, a catalyst uh, in, 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 in some way to help reinvigorate those discussions, or do you think it would be any different this time uh, than previous attempts? Thank you, Andrew. That's, that's a very relevant question. We have been uh, fortunate enough to work collaboratively with uh, like-minded peers in the ASEAN region with similar goals to improve cross-border payments, uh, which is unsurprising given that we're a highly integrated uh, uh, bunch of countries. You know, our, our intra-regional trade is almost a quarter of all our total trade. So some of the initiatives being pursued is something that we spoke about last week, the linkages of real-time payment systems in the ASEAN region uh, which enables near instant cross-border convenience uh, with using identifiers such as mobile phone and a QR code. Uh, we spoke about pay now, prompt pay, and we spoke about do it now, prompt pay, and there are more to come uh, in the region. But however, realistically, uh, let's be clear, there are some challenges here, right? Uh, when we talk about enabling a regional settlement network for more efficient cross-border payments, firstly, uh, the linkages facilitate instant clearing of transactions between countries. That's true. But settlement of the transactions is generally done on both countries uh, on a deferred basis using correspondent banking uh, arrangements. And we know there are issues there. Uh, it exposes the receiving financial institutions to credit risk, which need to be mitigated via uh, pre-funding or some collateral, collateral requirements. And that easily translates into uh, higher costs. Uh, secondly, also, we are operating through different level of developments and, uh, and, and, and priorities across the, re the, the, the region, meaning that, you know, when we, our efforts to interlink uh, payment systems among SASA members need to be done on a bilateral basis. Uh, so, yes, bilateral linkages may be sufficient to allow members who are ready to proceed first, but, you know, there could be duplication in efforts and may pose challenges and, and complexity to scale the linkages into a regional network in the future. And in, 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 in basically, this also has been the problem that beset us in the past. So while not entirely a silver bullet, uh, having a shared you know, MCBDC could address some of the issues that we face in the current model. First, the use of wholesale CBDC has the potential to enhance the efficiency of the settlement lake by facilitating instantaneous backend settlement. And we also can reduce reliance on corresponding banking arrangements. Uh, secondly, uh, 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 the development of a prototype like Project Number would enable jurisdictions to retain segregated and somewhat granular control of the shared multi CBDC platform. And these may address concerns by some jurisdictions on participating in a regional settlement network. In, 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 in traditional payment system design, for example, where the control lies with a single operator, it would be a challenge to establish a regional settlement network with a govern, governance model that could adequately, adequately address the concerns of individual central banks around ownership, operations, and control. So by unbundling the control and governance of the shared platform via DLT, we hope you know, a project like Project Dunbar could uh, produce a viable governance model for multi-CBDC arrangements and lay the foundation for the development of a regional settlement network. But let's be clear, having said all this, 
the inefficiency of the settlement lake and the issues surrounding governance and control are only some of the barriers. Given the creation of a scalable regional settlement network, um, it, it requires alignment in, in many aspects, in terms of legal, technical, and operational aspects. And other factors could also be important, such as strong political will, commitment from participants, and, and I think above all, it's the presence of a convincing business case to be made for each jurisdiction. Yeah. And, 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 and our needs are, are somewhat, uh, that there are commonalities, but there are also uh, some differences. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's fantastic. And I mean, one of the things that's really great from my perspective in having the four of you as partners on this is that we, we do benefit from um, different perspectives and different experiences. And it turns out, of course, that. Uh, the South African Reserve Bank is indeed uh, the operator of a regional settlement platform. So, Herco, I thought maybe you'd give you the floor for a couple minutes to talk about, you know, having actually had the benefit of operating a regional uh, payments platform uh, in Africa. Um, how do you think that, that this kind of conversation could inform the next generation of and, and or what would you have to say uh, as we kind of talk about these constructs in different regions? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Andrew. So very happy to share some of our insights. And, and I think um, maybe one of the main challenges that, that we faced in the SADC uh, RTGS context is how do we move from a single current, currency settlement system uh, currently in RAND to a truly multi or actual multi-currency settlement system? Um, and, and I think many of the kind of uh, questions and key issues that we're grappling with, we will we'll continue to grapple with in the context of uh, Dunbar, and we greatly look forward to that. So in our experience, um, I think the main uh, or the two main challenging in migrating to a true multi-currency regional settlement system is firstly um, ensuring and maintaining adequate liquidity in several currencies across borders. Um, and I think the problem as um, kind of the, the uh, one of the problem statements that Project Next is solved for is um, the, the kind of um, issue is exacerbated as the number of currencies and jurisdictions involved increases. And I think Chris also mentioned this issue around liquidity. And I think then also Fra mentioned um, this um, kind of potential issue around pre-funding, eligible collateral, et cetera. Um, so, so, and I think then secondly, it's, it's also around um, well, one of the key challenges we faced is, is answering the question of how do we create a system or solution that does not simply replicate the, the challenges experienced in the correspondent banking model um, by positioning central banks as, as some type of intermediary. Um, so, so and interestingly, I think in our experience, um, we, we've seen that many of the challenges are, are not uh, technical in nature. Um, again, an example being almost reaching consensus on, on what uh, collateral would be uh, or what, what would constitute eligible collateral um, for all the parties in, involved. Um, then I think similarly, some of our key insights in operating the, the actual static RTGS are that firstly, uh, role players, uh, stakeholders, institutions generally um, or often have a natural inc uh, inclination to stick to what they know and what they're mo most comfortable with. Um, meaning, secondly, that as a result, an incremental approach is probably preferable. Um, almost starting slowly um, and making steady progress rather than going big bang. Um, and, and I think, obviously, uh, central banks by nature are very conservative. Um, and, and I think if the gradual approach is not followed, it's unlikely that um, the kind of central banks and all the associated role players um, will be ready for a kind of MCBDC in five years or 10 years time if we don't start with the realistic and achievable smaller milestones in, in the interim. Um, so I think through Project Dunbar and, and from the SOAP's perspective in particular, we, we have a actual platform for solving uh, these well kind of known or reported challenges. Um, and I suppose particularly around ensuring liquidity in the relevant currencies on the multilateral platform and then exploring how multilateral platform um, could provide an appropriate solution for, for this uh, integration. Uh, let, let me stop there. Thanks very much, Andrew. Great, thanks, Herco. Um, we're, we're running a bit low on time, so what I'm gonna do is just ask maybe one more question and, and ask everyone to have a, a quick kind of rapid fire response onto it, and then I'll, I'll try to pick up a few questions that are coming in from the, uh, the audience online, but I'm actually gonna Stick with this notion of central banks being conservative that Herco you just mentioned, and, and 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 this kind of picks up on the general narrative of the discussion being that you know we've we've all been doing work in this general area for a few years, and um, you know Project Dunbar being the next incarnation uh, for us in, in this cross-border sense. But I guess the question is, you know, are we moving fast enough? And and uh, 
Maybe I, I'd start with you, Chris, uh, just to get your perspective on that. We'll just go around the go around the table. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I mean, I, I mean, you know, the question is, you know, are we moving fast enough on this sort of work? I mean, I, I, I think we're moving at a at a reasonable pace. I mean, you you look at the sort of the pace of research on CBDC, it, it's it's picked up tremendously in the, in the past year or so, and 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 you know, these are. Um, you know, these are sort of incredibly complex issues that we're trying to sort of grapple with here, and 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 and, and you know, decisions on whether or to whether and how to issue CBDCs are, are not decisions that should be taken lightly, given the risks and complexities involved. So, you know, careful research is is necessary here, um, and uh, and you know, and and you know, I, I'm sort of comfortable with sort of the pace we're going here, which to me, you know, seems quite fast. So. Um, you know, I know the challenges are, are worth 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 resolving quick, sooner rather than later, but but um, we need to be really conscious of the risks uh, and, and the complexities involved. Great, so Nandu. Well, uh, I would say uh, uh, my experience has been that central bank has have responded not because we, we should not say fast enough or slow. They've responded because there was no choice, because the market was moving so fast. It, uh, people are getting into this new area. And I would credit BIS a lot in this because with BIS stepping into this space, uh, providing the innovation hub infrastructure have really helped to bring together a, a common, uh, at least a common uh, uh, character to how Central Bank will respond to this change. So I think the BIS setting up the hub, putting a focus on this new area, bringing central banks together, I think it's quite fast in that context if you, if you historically compare against how central banks have responded to innovation. So that's one piece. Second, uh, I think uh, uh, I would say that the need, uh, the use case exists. We are not, it's not a, uh, a technology uh, uh, work looking for problems to solve. Uh, there is a real need, and the real need is the inefficient payment systems. And the previous question you asked whether regional payment infrastructure is working or not, the reality is that it's, not, it's, it's, it's still work in progress for 10 years. And the, the real elephant in the room is settlement. And, uh, and it, it, I, I doubt whether on a traditional structure we will ever agree to a common settlement infrastructure. Mm. The way has to be a decentralized uh, settlement infrastructure, which Dunbar is picking up. So there is a real need, and we, we have been struggling for 10 years, and there is no way out. Now with Dunbar coming in, uh, with the whole wholesale CBDC, multi-currency, multi jurisdiction coming in, you're really solving a real problem which has been unsolved for many years. So real demand, backed by people running ahead of ourselves, uh, is, the, is what I would say the state of the play of Central Bank and wholesale CBDC. Great. Uh, Fra. Yeah, I mean, as mentioned, there's a real problem and now there's a potential real solution. But again, you know, jumping in, we need to have our eyes open in terms of what we are getting into. Uh, uh, certainly, there are potential for setbacks and we, we need to be cautious about that. But having said that, I mean, really, uh, we, we have no option. We cannot afford to just wait by the sidelines. You know, we have to get into it and, and in a way, learning by doing. Uh, one aspect which is really critical is that we really need to, you know, have a, a close collaboration between the public and private uh, sector in order to really harness the benefits of CBDC. So in a way, perhaps the issue is not so much technological. Technology has offered us a solution, but it's also a question of governance, process, uh, education, and, and things like that. So that also uh, is important. And, and I think sometimes it's precisely those things that could hold us back. And last but not least, Herco. Uh, thanks, Andrew. So, so I suppose another way of um, potentially thinking about the issue is maybe flipping the question around and asking, are we, are we moving slowly enough? So I think, again, to this issue around conservatism, et cetera, um, I think the stakes are high. And if we kind of don't get this right, um, I, I think we, we uh, the, the chances of a do-over um, are, are quite slim and we don't often kind of get the, the, the opportunity for a do-over. Um, so I think from that perspective, in, in kind of my view, um, <laughs> I suppose slow gradual progress is, is probably better than, than Big Bang. Um, so, Jan, if, if I can almost um, 
yeah, I suppose you use an analogy of, uh, I read an account of someone climbing Everest and, and the, the guide kept telling this person, go slower, go slower, go slower. So it's it's kind of, uh, it's it's almost not a, a slow and steady kind of wins the race. And, and he said, because obviously as the air gets thinner, thinner, et cetera, you don't want to almost exhaust yourself before you kind of reach, you reach the peak. Um, and I think then maybe just a final um, quick comment is, I think um, we all might have kind of preconceived um, ideas around what the issues kind of um, potential, and, and I think the word potential is, is being used quite often. Um, but I think until we get kind of really into the thick of things, experimenting with that, um, I, I think all, all everything will kind of just be hypothetical, conjectural, et, et cetera. Um, and, and I think um, it's almost, I think as a collective, we will potentially need to almost conceptually agree that uh, the, the next step will be kind of data and inside dependence. So I don't think we can preempt anything. But let me stop there. Thanks very much, Andrew. That's great. Uh, I really appreciate all those the very thoughtful answers. And, and I certainly agree that, you know, at the very least, what we're looking at is, is probably a once in a, a career, or once in a lifetime kind of massive change in terms of how how this global kind of network settles and, and works. And I think uh, we're, we're honored and lucky to be uh, part of this journey and, and certainly grateful to be working with all of you uh, in, in this next phase of our, 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 our project. Um, a couple questions coming in. Actually, there's tons of questions coming in here, but I'm trying to cherry pick a few that we might be able to get through in, in the next few minutes. But um, one interesting one here, uh, throwing it out there. So a CDBC network for seamless, uh, w to work seamlessly internationally, uh, would the central banks consider to develop global digital identity to facilitate the payment process? Um, I'll, I'll throw that one over to you, Stop, because I know that's a, a topic that's near and dear to you. Well, well uh, I have spoken about that. If you want to grow decentralized finance, identity is a key component there. But I don't think it's just, it'll be a, it'll be a self-sovereign idea which will probably drive more because uh, we can argue both sides that there is a need for a, a centralized ID system. So we trust this instrument and uh, that, that's one way. But the reality is that it has to interoperate with many other IDs. Uh, and um, uh, again, I, I guess the question is again coming from that the world has moved ahead of where we are now. They're all looking at decentralized finance. They're all thinking that, in fact, I was joking at, at the DBS summit yesterday. Today, when you go to bank, they actually don't sell you anything. They tell you, yes, take the receipt, go home. I'm managing your product. But the future would be when you go to a bank, you buy a time deposit, you'll actually get a product back to home. The, actually, the time deposit running in your phone, and it is accruing interest and paying you. The whole process is happening here. So there's a need for decentralizing that finance out of the current construct into your endpoint devices. If that happens, you need a strong digital identity uh, infrastructure, a very credible digital currencies, a smart contract with 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 uh, with code which is uh, which is complying to the regulation and obligation it needs to have. There probably the need from a codified regulation. Who knows who's going to who's going to issue those uh, uh, governance tokens? So that whole set of progress need need to happen in the space to get to that future of financial services, which we believe is to decentralized finance and embedded finance. Yeah. That's really interesting. I, I, I've done enough research in the identity space to know just how hard it is. It, yes. and, and as a payments guy, uh, I consider payments hard, but I think identity is probably yes. many times as more difficult. It's actually. beyond identity. There's a lot yeah. of complex yeah. uh, uh, yeah. social impact also. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and certainly we've talked this, this evening about different countries being in different kind of phases of development, and, and certainly that's very true in the identity space as well. Uh, so yeah, lots of work there for sure. Um, the next question I thought was interesting here that popped up. Um, so when we contemplate a cross-border payments uh, platform such as we are, um, you know, and again, this kind of ties into this different phases of development construct. We've heard even uh, participants tonight talk about, you know, there's no urgent need to issue a CDBC uh, in a domestic context. And by extension, they, that might also include a wholesale CDBC. So how would this network or would this network contemplate the interplay between some countries that have indeed uh, issued a wholesale CDBC and, and, and other countries that, that might not be ready to, would they still be able to play on the field somehow? Or how do we kind of, how do we think about that multi-generational uh, integration? I'm not sure, it's kind of a tough one, but um, maybe Chris, I'll throw that over to you. I see, I see you're, uh, you got your thinking cap on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, you know, if I understand the question, 
correctly, it's, it's this question about if, if you're a jurisdiction that's not, hasn't taken the decision to issue CBDC, you know, c could you play in this CBDC-based system? Um, you know, I, you know, I, um, I, you know, it would it would introduce additional complications, of course, and yeah, you know, then you have to talk about, you know, can we make the system interoperate with some sort of domestic system that that country has, and um, um, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, that's, that sounds, you know, I don't know. It sounds like a challenge, but I mean, the one point I would make though is, I mean, you know, there's, and we, I said this at the beginning in relation to what the way we're thinking about this. I mean, you know. We, we don't see a need for, you know, a retail CBDC in Australia, you know, right at the moment, uh, given, you know, a, a range of considerations that was laid out previously. But, you know, you know, it is possible at some point in time a wholesale CBDC of some some description, but, you know, with more limited access could could be something that, 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 that you know, that there may be a case for. So, so you know, it might be that, may be that jurisdictions don't have sort of retail CBDCs, but just have a wholesale CBDCs, essentially just, you know, wholesale payment systems that are running on a different technology. Um, um, so, so, that, so that sort of situation might emerge in the future. Yeah, I mean, uh, for sure, that's a, that's a tough one. I kind of put you on the spot there. Um, we are desperately short on time, so we probably have maybe one more uh, audience question here. And, and again, this is probably not something we can answer given the current state of the, the project, but m m just putting it out there. So how can a common platform using CDBC better address FX conversion than the status quo? Uh, will the FX uh, price uh, be different off network versus the platform? So um, I don't know, uh, Herco or Fra, would, you, would either of you guys be interested in kind of just thinking through you know, our approach to answering that through, through the next few months? I see Herco nodding his head. <laughs> uh, sure, sure. Th thanks, Andrew. I'll, I'll be quick and then hand over to Frost. So, uh, I think again, very much around potentially almost baking certain requirements, etc., um, kind of into the design of the CBDC. And again, I think once we start thinking a, a, around design, they, they, they'll. So the question around what is different, kind of the, 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 the token um, kind of the innovation is, is almost the, the tokenized um, CBDC or central bank money. And, and I think that provides the opportunity. So I think potentially the solution might almost be there coupled with this uh, smart contract programmability type of um, functionality. Um, but let me stop there and hand over to Frog. Thanks very much. Yeah, yeah, as, exactly. I think, I think it's really too soon to tell. It depends a lot on how the systems morph. Uh, it could be a very highly tokenized system, uh, and at this juncture, I'm not sure really, you know, what form it'll take. It's very platform centric in a way. Yeah, agreed. It's and it is early days for sure, but um, we're you know we're intending to uh, dig deep over the next uh, 12 weeks or so, and certainly we'll have a lot more to say on all of these uh, elements uh, when we uh, probably by by around the Singapore FinTech Festival. So. Look, we're going to wrap it there. I want to thank all of the participants uh, online. Thank you so much for taking some time to watch, and, and, uh, and, and certainly uh, uh, part, hope you enjoyed the discussion. Certainly thank all my fellow panelists for your time and interest, and looking forward to, uh, to working with you, as I've mentioned. So thanks again. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you, gentlemen, for your insights. With that, everyone, we've come to the end of the Green Shoot sessions today. But before you go, don't forget to fill up the polling form that's going to pop up right now in front of your screen if you're on Zoom. Uh, we appreciate you to rate our session, feedback for us. For those of you in the live audience, um, speak to any of us. We'll be open to any of your feedback, anything important to us. And in, most importantly, we just want to make it better for everybody. All right? Um, with that, we look forward to you joining us again. Most importantly, the Singapore FinTech Festival happening starting on the 8th of November. Tickets are available now. Look at the side of the screen. And, you know, um, just, you know, on behalf of everyone, good evening, good night, good morning, wherever you are, if you're watching on the other side of the road. On behalf of the entire team, speakers and everybody, thank you, stay safe, mask on, not like me, and bye-bye.